Praise the Lord. It's good to be back in the house of God this evening with Free Indeed Ministry. I'm James Cooper. And we preach the truth that Jesus said would make the believer free. And I know that every, every church, every denomination, every doctrine, every person out there believes that they know the truth. They believe that their church preaches the truth. They believe that, that what their church doctrine is, is the truth. But Jesus said the truth would do something. He said it would make you free. And there's no doubt what he was talking about being made free from. He said, he that commits sin is a servant to sin. He said, but if the Son make you free, you shall be free indeed. Not only free from the outward acts of sin, but from that slave master, the sin nature that we were born with. Now, if what you have believed has not made you free, can it be that truth? Was Jesus uh, speaking the truth? Is there such a truth that just the knowledge of it can make you free? If there is, if what you have trusted and believe has not done that, then it's not possible that it is that truth. The truth that he's talking about is simply the truth about him, who Christ is, what God sent him to do according to the scriptures. Praise God, this is so important because there is so many different Jesuses being preached today. So many different uh, beliefs and doctrines and gospels being preached today. It must be according to the scriptures. And when I say according to the scriptures, I have to emphasize it must be according to the scriptures of the King James Bible because the modern translations have changed the word of God. The modern translations have destroyed the finished work of Calvary by putting it into a process that you are being saved, that you are being sanctified. And if you believe this, if you believe that it's a process that you're that you're that God's working on you concerning sin, you will never be sanctified. You will never be holy. You will never be free from sin. You will die in your sin because God does not work on sin, taking a person's sin away in a process. The last words of Jesus on the cross was it is finished. It is a finished work. And when Christ comes into the heart, it is finished. Sin is gone. Praise God. I say this often because I feel the urgency and the, and the burden to warn the people. There is so much false teaching out there. So much deception out there. But Satan's greatest victory in this last generation are the modern translations of Bibles. This, this is his tactics from the beginning. From the very day sin entered mankind, it was when Satan had changed the Word of God, he was trying to get Eve to eat of that tree that was forbidden. And she said, God said the day we eat of this tree, we will surely die. And so Satan, the serpent, changes God's Word. He says, God knows you won't surely die, but you will become as God's. Knowing both good and evil. He changed what God had said. And look what happened. Sin entered through Adam's transgression. Sin entered the heart of man. And every person that's been born on this planet since that day was born in sin. With the nature of the serpent. With the sin nature in them. That's what Christ came to destroy. That's what Christ came to take away. He, he came to save us from our sin. Not what we're doing, but what we are. And when what we are is changed, when he takes that sin out of the heart, everything that a person does is changed. They're a new creature. But because of the deception, because of the widespread deception, in Revelation chapter 12, it talks about that serpent, that old dragon, the devil, which deceiveth the whole world. And we are in the last days of the last generation. When do you think he's going to deceive the whole world? It began in that early church. It began immediately after the Lord breathed out of his spirit and, and, and filled that early church with the Holy Ghost. And it became a living, breathing body of Christ upon this earth. Satan immediately went to work sending in false teachers 
changing God's Word. We're living in the fullness of it. The, the, the only time the words Antichrist is even used in the Bible is five times by the Apostle John in 1 John and 2 John. And he says the spirit of Antichrist is already at work in the church today. In his day, 2,000 years ago, man has taken this, this word and built a whole doctrine, end time scenario doctrine upon the Antichrist. There is no such words in the Bible, the Antichrist. It's the spirit of Antichrist which John... Uh, uh, identified as being deceivers, false teachers, de- uh, deceiving the people. We are in the last days of the last generation and He has deceived the whole world. But the truth has not lost its power. The truth of Christ, who He is, what God sent Him to do and how that He did it all at Calvary is still that truth that Jesus said would make you free. It is still the power of God Praise God. People say nobody can be free from sin. And they're right. Nobody can produce this of themselves. But when it takes the power of God to do it, when God does all the work, it makes it all possible. And God is God. This is nothing for Him to send the Spirit of His Son into the believer. And sin is gone. Praise God in a moment of time. Yes, there is a process to to learning the Word of God. And, 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 and there's always a, a more in our walk with God. We will grow in the knowledge of the Word. We will grow in the knowledge of Christ as we seek Him, as we study the Word. But there is no growing out of sin. That is the very first step of our walk with God. That's what salvation is. What the modern church says is impossible, that no one can be free from sin, is what? Salvation is, and it's the beginning. It's the very beginning of our walk with God. It's not a goal in the future. Praise God. I want to go to a passage in 2 Peter. And I'm going to start in chapter 1, verse 16. Peter said, We have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For He received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to Him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with Him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Now I want to present something to you. I used to think that this was talking about that voice from heaven that Peter said we heard when he was with them in the holy mount, the mount of transfiguration. Peter heard the voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye Him. And Peter says, But we have a more sure word of prophecy. And I used to think, well, how, how can there be a more sure word than what Peter heard from heaven? And, but he's pointing us to the prophets. He's pointing us to the record that God gave of His Son. But he's also saying, it's a more sure word than mine as an eyewitness. Peter said, we've not followed coming, cunningly devised fables, but are eyewitnesses He knew Jesus. He lived with Jesus for three and a half years, walked with Him, seen all the great miracles and healings. He was with Him during His whole ministry on the earth. And He said, even as an eyewitness, there's a more sure word than mine. He said, there's a more sure word than that voice that we heard from heaven. He said, it is the word of the prophets. Praise God. I tell you, if our faith is not built upon the holy prophets of God and the holy apostles of God from, through their word, the record that God gave of His Son through them, if our belief, if our faith is not built upon this, Christ according to the Scriptures, then we have nothing. We have nothing. So many people today go to church 
and take the word of their pastor. Somebody was telling me the other day how they had visited another church and, and he said, the first thing I noticed is none of the people brought in Bibles with them. They're, 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 they're listening to the preacher. They're taking his word for it. And so many people do that today. When it's our eternity that's at stake, we will stand alone before God on Judgment Day. We will be sentenced to one of two places for all of eternity. And people gamble with the one thing they cannot afford to lose, their eternal soul. Do not take a man's word, a preacher's word, for what you believe. Don't take my word for what, for what I'm saying if it doesn't line up with the word of God. Know for yourself what you believe. Most of what is preached out there today is not even found in the Scriptures without taking them completely out of context. The doctrines that Christ took the penalty for your sin is not even found in the Bible. There's not one Scripture that talks about He died to take the penalty or the punishment. Not one. There's not one scripture that talks about the blood of Jesus covers your sin and God can't see your sin. There's not one. There is so much that has filled the churches that is being presented as the gospel of Christ that is not according to the prophets, the prophets of old. And Peter says this is the most sure word that we have. He says, we have a more sure word of prophecy whereunto you would do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the star, day star arise in your hearts knowing this first that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old Time, in old time, by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. He said, no prophecy is of any private interpretation. And Brother Michael that also does this ministry with us, he, he usually preaches on Friday night. He was telling me this morning about the other day that he had went into a barber shop and was... Uh, getting his hair cut, but he said that there, there was a, a group of people in there and this one man started talking about some things and says, well, but the Bible says, and Michael said, that opened the door. He said, I started sharing the gospel with them. And just talking about uh, uh, salvation from sin, being made free from sin. He said, man, there was a, a, a time there when everybody in there was was like turning against me, saying nobody's free from sin. Nobody can be free from sin. And the man that seemed to know the Scriptures, who had been actually talking filthy before uh, they, they started talking about the Bible and the Lord. And, but Michael quoted the Scripture in 1 John chapter 3. For whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. And this man says, but you're just not interpreting that right. Well, this is what I want to bring out. Peter said, no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. And I was thinking about this just before the service this evening. You know, if you went to another country that you did not speak their language, you would need an interpreter. Why? Because you're not going to be able to understand the language over there. And an interpreter will interpret it from one language to another. Okay, but we're talking about a King James Bible or we're talking about a Bible in English, the language that we speak. It needs no interpretation. The Word of God means what it says and it says what it means. Now, this man that was saying you, you're not interpreting it right, he was, he was actually saying you're not interpreting it to, to mean what our church doctrine teaches. You're not interpreting it to mean what we believe. And the reason we talk about the, the King James Bible, the the... King James Bible 
gives you the word of God as was written by the prophets, as was written by the apostles. And you can use a Strong's Concordance to look up the words and see what they meant in the Hebrew or in the Greek and get the full understanding if there's a word that you don't understand. But these, these new translations of Bibles does not change or translate it to, to like an easier understanding. It changes the meanings of the words. It uses words that the apostles and the prophets did not use. They did not say. And, and this man, just like many, using the modern translations of the Bible, that same scripture, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. These modern translations say they do not practice sin or they do not habitually sin. That is using a completely different word. It is not translating it into something easier to understand. It's translating it into something that the apostles did not say. He did not use that word which would mean practice or habitually. That's a completely different Greek word, praso. The apostle John said poio. They do not commit even one single act of sin because they're born of God, a holy father. And the source of what they are, that new creature is of God. God does not birth sinful creatures that just do not practice sin, but they still sin every now and then. They do not habitually sin. No, no, this is not a translation it is changing the Word of God. It is the very source of Satan's deception. When the man said, you're not translating that correctly, it don't need translation. But to translate it is translating it into Satan's language. The language of the lamb beast that John warned us about that he saw rise up in the last generation that looks like a lamb. It has horns like a lamb. It looks, it presents itself as the lamb of God, as the church of Jesus Christ. He says, but when it spake, it spake as a dragon. He called it the lamb beast. And I believe the words he heard that he un understood and identified it as the dragon was we're all sinners. As long as we're in this body, we're going to be a sinner. These scriptures that are speaking the absolute gospel of Jesus Christ need to be translated into the language of the lamb beast. And that's what these modern translations of Bibles have done. That's why the modern church is filled with preachers saying we're all sinners. Nobody's free from sin. They have lost the gospel truth that makes free. Therefore, they've lost the reality that goes with that gospel truth. Praise God. When the scripture, man, Paul said, seeing that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. When the scripture says, He that is dead is free from sin, crucified with Christ. Our old man of sin is destroyed. He that is dead is free from sin. I can see the apostle Paul writing Romans and, and, and thinking, man, I don't know how to make it any plainer than this. I want to use great plainness of speech. How much plainer can you get? That does not need translation. It does not need to be changed unless you love your sin, your pleasure is in unrighteousness. Then you need it translated into the language of the lamb beast. Into the language of the dragon. Be not deceived. Satan does not come to you as a devil. He does not come to you in witchcraft and devil worshiping to try to draw you away from the truth. He's going to come with Jesus. If he knows you want to be saved and you're looking for Jesus Christ, he's going to come to you with a Jesus. A Jesus that saves. But it's always going to be a saved from hell. That is not the Christ of prophecy that is not the Christ of God who came to save His people from their sin. Man, we talk about this so often that, that the, the meaning of words has been completely destroyed through the modern doctrines of the church. Saved means saved. And everyone knows what that word means until they walk into a church house and a preacher gives them a form 
or a religious ordinance or ceremony or whatever it is that that church does in, in their presentation as the gospel and, and salvation. They'll have a person repeat a sinner's prayer. I've seen this so many times in the prisons. A, a, a preacher getting a bunch of men lined up across the front and having them repeat a sinner's prayer with them and telling them now you're saved. How does he know their heart? He doesn't. No man should tell another man, now you're saved. Only that person will know when their sin is gone and when Christ has came in and they're free. Only that person and the Lord will know when that happens. But I'll tell you when it does happen. Everyone else will see the fruit on that tree. They'll know something has happened to that person. Something has changed them. Praise God. Brother Tyler reminded me the other night how one of the chaplains, I was sharing my testimony with them, one of the chaplains of the prison, and, and, and the chaplain said, well, you're just one of them that was radically saved. Because I was telling them how I was addicted to alcohol, drugs, and pornography. And it was all gone in a moment of time. This was after 13 years of a religious struggle with sin. What people would say is the normal Christian walk, backsliding, coming back, backsliding, coming back. No, that is a, a, a religious sinner trying to be a child of God, which is impossible. They're two different creatures, praise God, and they have two different destinations for all of eternity. But I was sharing with them how when I got truly saved, about eight or nine years ago, that it was all gone in a moment of time. What I struggled with for 13 years was instantly gone when Christ come in. And he says, well, you're one of those that was radically saved. And I have to tell you this, I'm one of those that were saved. Praise God. It is a radical salvation. All Sin is gone when Christ comes in. And that's not just for one or two or, or just a few that, that have experienced something different or special. It's for every child of God who is born of the Spirit of God. I'm going to go to a scripture now. In Philippians chapter 2. I guess I will start. I'm just going to read the scripture that's on my heart. It's chapter 2, verse 12. Paul said, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, how do you work out your own salvation when it's not of our works? You obey the truth. You believe the truth. You obey from the heart by believing the truth. Praise God. It's like God is asking you to believe an impossible thing and trust in Him to do it. It's not going to compute with the human understanding. It's not going to make sense. The gospel of Jesus Christ is outside the realm of the human possibilities. And that's why so many people say that's impossible. Yes, it is. For us, it's impossible. That if we believe the truth of the Scriptures, if we believe that our old man is crucified, not in a process, not being crucified, he is crucified with Christ. And when they crucified Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago, my old man of sin, your old man of sin died with him that day on the cross. If you will believe this, if you will lay hold to it and trust in him that your old man died with him in union with him on the cross, something is going to change inside of you. It's going to... Reach down deep inside to the darkness of your soul where you cannot wash and cleanse your own heart, your own soul. 
your own sin nature. You cannot, only the blood of Jesus can wash and cleanse and sanctify the believer. But 2,000 years ago when they crucified our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, they crucified our old man of sin. And people say, that's foolishness. God says, believe it. Believe it and receive it. Praise God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save those that believe. Paul said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. There is a world full of deception today. Man, I have sat in the prison and for four years and listened to every service, two services on Saturday, two on Sunday, every doctrine that's out there on the chaplain's list at that one unit, there was 450 ministers on the, on the volunteer list. And I heard every doctrine there is. Doctrines of devils has, is what's filled the church. Religious doctrines of devils. And with so much presented, those whose pleasure is in unrighteousness, they will lay hold to a doctrine that gives them a salvation from hell while they continue in their sin because that's what they're looking for. That's what they want. But it's not real. There is no salvation from hell while you continue in your sin. There is no such thing except what Satan presents to you as a gospel, another gospel, another Jesus. But he's the father of the lie. When there's so much deception out there today. But you hear the truth of the gospel. That a child of God is not a sinner and a sinner is not a child of God. And if you'll believe the true report and that's what you want, that's what you need, you can be made free in a moment of time. Paul said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You choose, you make up your mind. Is a holy God going to give birth to a holy people or a sinful people that are just religious? You decide. You work out your own salvation with fear and trembling because it's you that's going to stand before God for you. I'm going to go to another passage in Acts chapter 2. This is Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost. And I'm going to start at chapter 2, verse 36. He said, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Praise God. No, or now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now this word remission is the Greek word aphesis, which means freedom. Praise God. Freedom of sins. And this does not come through a water baptism. Anyone that knows, anyone that's ever been baptized in water knows that that did not wash the inside of the cup. It did not take your sin nature away. This is not a water baptism that gives you remission or freedom from sins. When Jesus was talking to His disciples and He said, I have a baptism to be baptized with. And how am I straightened until it be accomplished? He had already been baptized in water by John the Baptist. John's baptism of water was a baptism unto repentance. A baptism of change your mind. Think differently. Praise God. Come out of the law of Moses. For that's not the way to God. The Christ has come. A baptism of repentance. But the, the baptism Jesus was speaking of 
He said, I have a baptism to be baptized with still. He says, and how am I straightened? That word straightened is, is like stressed and worried until it be accomplished. He was talking about his death of the cross. And Paul tells us, Know you not that so many of you as were baptized into Jesus Christ was baptized into His death. This is that baptism by faith. He goes a few more verses and tells exactly what it is. He says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with Him, that the body of sin be destroyed, that henceforth we do not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. This is that baptism and the word baptized in the Greek, one of the definitions is washed. Praise God. And it was a common word used in that day. There's a scripture in Mark. I believe it's in chapter 4, but it's a, a scripture where Mark uses that word twice in one scripture, actually talking about the washing of pots and vessels and the washing of your hands. But he used the word baptismo, the Greek word baptismo, which means washed. We think of it only as being dipped in water in a religious ceremony. That is the symbolic religious ordinance of the real thing. It's symbolic of the real thing. There's nothing wrong with the water baptism as long as you don't put your trust in that for salvation because it cannot save you from your sin. But the washing of that, that faith of Christ, knowing that our old man was crucified with him, knowing that the blood of Jesus sanctifies the people, washes and cleanses them on the inside. This is that faith that, that saves the soul. Peter said, repent and be baptized or be washed. Every one of you in the name of Jesus, the Christ, for the freedom of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off. That's even us. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort saying, Save yourself from this untoward generation. That word untoward means perverted. Twisted and perverted generation. Now again, how do you save yourself? The same way as, as when Paul was saying, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Believe the true report. Believe that truth that Jesus said would make the believer free. You know, if you, if you are one that says, I don't believe anyone can be free from sin, you don't have a chance. You don't stand a chance. This gospel truth that Jesus said, knowing that truth would make you free, it ain't just knowing it, you got to believe it. It's a truth that has to be believed and received. Praise God. Save yourself from this perverted generation. Now, I want to go over to actually I'm going to go to Matthew Chapter 23, and I'm going to talk about two different generations. Two different generations that was unlike any other generation that's ever lived on this earth. The generation in the days of Jesus was a chosen generation. They was the generation that the Messiah, the Prince, would come to. It was prophesied 490 years before Jesus was born. The angel Gabriel brought the message to Daniel in Daniel 9, 24 through 27 of one called the Messiah, the Prince. That it gave a timeline. It gave the very year that he would appear, which is the year he stood on the banks of the river Jordan, was baptized and began his ministry. But it told exactly what his mission was to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. 
In other words, to take away the nature of the serpent, that sin which, which was inherited through Adam's transgression, to make reconciliation, bring us back to God, what God had created mankind to be in the beginning, and bring in the very nature, the image and likeness of God that God had created man to have, the everlasting righteousness of God Himself. But that generation knew the timeline and they were all in great expectation. That was the generation that the Christ came to. He came unto His own and His own received Him not. But to as many as received Him gave He the power or the word is the privilege to become the sons of God. But I want to speak about that generation that Christ came to and our generation that Christ is going to return to. These two generations are unlike any other generation that has ever lived on this planet. And the biggest, it, the, the, the most significant thing that's ever happened on this earth is just ahead of us. Here in Matthew 23, Jesus is rebuking the religious leaders of His generation. In verse 15, He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you can pass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when He is made, you make Him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Man, I see this in the ministers that are flooding into the prisons, which is the same doctrines and ministers that fill the churches across this land. They will go into the prisons and preach and, and, and carry a gospel that will make religious slaves out of the people, slaves to sin, but that they have been made twofold the child of hell. They have become vaccinated against the truth of the gospel because that preacher will tell them, now you're saved and God sees you as holy. God sees you through the blood of Jesus. But really we're still sinners, making them twofold the child of hell. But Jesus is speaking to His generation. In verse 33, He says, You serpents, you generation of vipers, how shall you escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall you scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Barcheus, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. Verily, I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. He was speaking to His generation, which was destroyed in 70 A.D. Forty years after Calvary, the destruction that Jesus is prophesying to them about, warning them about. He said, all of this will come upon this generation. That's the generation Peter was telling them, save yourself from this wicked, perverted generation because the destruction, the wrath of God is already determined upon it. Jesus said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and you would not... He said, I've sent the prophets, I've sent holy men of God. And you stoned them, you killed them. You rejected what they were saying. How often I would have gathered you when you hear the truth of the gospel that Christ died to save you from your sin, to make you free from sin. This is the Lord trying to gather you. Don't be one that rejects the truth that can make you free. If you reject the truth of Christ, there is nothing left. There is nothing left but the lies. The lies that have filled the churches today. There's only one gospel. There's only one salvation. 
There's only one Savior and He saves His people from their sin. He's a Savior. His people are not slaves. They're saved. They're rescued. They're delivered. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Now, keep this Scripture, verse 36, in mind. Jesus said, Verily I say unto you all, these things shall come upon this generation. And chapter 24 starts, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. Never again would He teach publicly. Never again would He go into the temple to teach. And His disciples came to Him for to show Him the buildings of the temples. Because Jesus had already told them the temple would be destroyed. They came to him, his disciples came and said, See, or Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he said upon the Mount of Olives, the, the disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? Now notice here, they may not know it, but they're asking him two different questions. He just told them about the destruction that was coming upon them. And they said, when shall these things be? They may think this destruction he's telling them about, them about is the end of the world. And it was for so many of them. But it wasn't the end of the world. We are living 2,000 years later. He, they asked him two different questions. When shall these things be? The destruction that he said this generation will not pass away until all be fulfilled. The destruction, the wrath of God that was already determined upon that generation that had rejected their Messiah. When shall these things be? And when shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? Two different questions. So as he goes into... What he's fixing to say, he answers both of these questions. He answers and tells them about the destruction that's coming upon this, their generation. And then he jumps 2,000 years into the last generation and tells them about the signs of his coming and the end of the world, which is our generation. We're 54 years into that last generation you know, people say, well, I've heard this my whole life. My grandparents, my great-grandparents thought they were living in that last generation. They thought the Lord would return to their generation. There are prophecies of the Scriptures that until they happen, people can only uh, try to guess at what this means. This is how it's going to be. This is how it's going to happen. But once it does happen, you can see it and know for sure like Peter said on the day of Pentecost, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. This is that prophecy fulfilled. Praise God. And there was things that had not happened until June 6 of 1967 when Israel went back under Jewish control for the first time since 70 AD. And there is a prophecy fulfilled right there that began the last generation which we are 54 years into as of this month. I'm going to jump over now to Luke chapter 21. Actually, Matthew 24 and Luke 21 is the same exact setting. We're just going over to another gospel... And to get the full story of certain events, you've got to read all the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And one will tell a little more or something different from the others that they remembered as they was writing their Gospel, as the Holy Ghost brought these things to their memory. But here, this is the same exact setting. And Jesus tells them in... Luke 21 and verse 20. When you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, 
then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. He's answering that first question. When shall these things be? He told them that the, the temple would be destroyed. Not one stone would be left upon another. And the destruction that was coming upon that generation. And he's telling them, when you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. And let them which are in the midst of it depart. The, which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter there into. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. Now, in this verse, verse 24, Luke 21 and 24, this verse is where Jesus goes from answering that first question and jumps all the way into the last generation. He jumps 2,000 years ahead into our generation. He told them, they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. In that destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., the Jews were destroyed there after a three and a half year war. And the Gentiles ruled over Jerusalem and Israel. And this is amazing. Too, too amazing to be coincidence. For 1934 and a half years, that's the same amount of time from Abraham's circumcision which began God's covenant with the Jew until the gospel started going to the Gentiles. 1934 and a half years. Jesus said, Jerusalem will be trodden under the foot of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. That brings us to June 6 of 1967. Israel, Jerusalem went back under Jewish control for the first time since 70 A.D. And Jesus begins the very next thing He says is giving the signs of our generation, of the last generation. He says, And there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Now, there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars. Two years after this last generation began in 67, two years later, America put the first man on the moon and space travel began. What more of a significant sign could there be than this as signs in the sun and the moon and the stars? And upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity. The word perplexity means no remedy. There's no way out. There's no answer for the trouble that has come upon the nations. Man, watch the world news today. Every nation is in distress. Every nation is in perplexity. There's no answer for it. There's no remedy. Things are not going to get better. There is a time of trouble coming upon this generation that Jesus said has never been a time of trouble like this since the beginning of creation, which will end with His return. He says, the sea and the waves roaring. I did a research on hurricanes and earthquakes, which was one of the signs He gave over in Matthew 24, the same setting. And... I was really amazed and shocked that before this last generation began, there, you know, there was earthquakes and hurricanes, which I expected, but I was shocked that there was only about one major 
earthquake or major hurricane about every 25 years throughout the 1700s and 1800s. We come into the 1900s. They became a little more frequent, a little more uh, often, but we come into this last generation and they just exploded. And now it is nothing to hear about 10 or 12 or 15 hurricanes in a season. This was unheard of before this last generation. Jesus gave this sign of the last generation and He said that there will be signs in the sea and the waves roaring. But we've grown up in the midst of these signs being fulfilled all around us and to us it's, it's normal. It was not normal before this last generation. Over in Matthew, He says these natural catastrophes, these signs. He says they're the beginning of sorrows. And that word sorrows is the Greek word for birth pangs. He's saying these earthquakes and, and signs in the seas and the waves roaring and, and all these natural catastrophes we're seeing. He said it's the same as the birth pangs of a woman. Throughout this last generation they will become more frequent and more intense leading up to His return. The storms are becoming more frequent and more intense. The earthquakes, the natural catastrophes, forest fires, global warming, floods, all of these things is as the birth pains of a woman getting ready to give birth. We're in the last days of the last generation. The Lord is coming soon. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Choose for yourself what a holy God would give His own Son for to die on the cross to save His people from their sin just like His Word says without a translation. Or do you need it to be translated into Satan's language, into the language of the lamb beast, that He took the penalty for your sin and God gives birth to a sinful creature that is saved from hell. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Men's hearts felling them for fear and looking after those things which are coming upon the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When you see these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your head. For your redemption draweth nigh. This is the redemption of our bodies. Our redemption of our soul, saved from sin, was accomplished 2,000 years ago at the cross. Our Redeemer died to redeem His people from all iniquity, from all sin. But there is still a redemption of this body which will be changed in the twinkling of an eye from an incorruptible, which means it will not grow old, it will not decay, it will be an incorruptible body. But he says, so likewise. I skipped a, a, a verse. Verse 29, he said, And he spake to them a parable, Behold the fig tree and all the trees, when they now shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise, when you see the trees budding, you know that summer is close. It's even at hand. So likewise, when you see these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Now, when did we see these things that he's talking about to our generation? When did we see these things begin to come to pass? 54 years ago, when Israel, when Jerusalem went back under Jewish control, that was the first sign He gave to our generation. 
Jerusalem will be trodden under the down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. That happened in our generation. That began the countdown of this last generation. He said, when you see this, when you see these things begin to come to pass, lift up your heads. For your redemption draweth nigh. Verse 32. Verily I say unto you, Remember, he told his generation, all of these things shall come upon this generation. He was talking about that destruction of Israel, that destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, and it happened just like Jesus said. And he says, Verily I say unto you, he's answering that second question, when shall be the sign of his coming and the end of the world? And he's speaking to our generation that we're 54 years into. And he says, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all be fulfilled. All, including His return. We are the generation that the end of the world has come, will come upon. We are the generation that the return of Jesus Christ will come to very, very soon. Save yourself from this wicked and perverted generation that is a religious darkness that has filled the land. A religious darkness of deception and lies that has filled the churches. You can think about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and then look at America. Same-sex marriage has been legalized in this last generation People say, well, that's going to bring the wrath of God. That's going to bring the judgment of God. That is the judgment of God as He has given America over to a reprobate mind. This last generation right now is being fitted for destruction, which is just ahead of us. Now, He told His generation, when you see these things begin to come to pass, he said, flee to the mountains. Those that believed the words of Jesus that fled to the mountains, they were not harmed. They were kept. They were preserved. He told them, we're to flee. He said, this generation shall not pass away till all be Fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unaware. For as a snare shall it come upon all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. He told them to flee to the mountains. Now he's telling this last generation where to flee to. He says, watch ye there for and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. He tells us, watch and pray always. The place that we are to flee to is Him. Abide in Him. Psalms 91 is prophetically speaking of those who will abide in Christ. That is our ark of safety in this end time, in this storm that's coming. The ark of safety. He says that we're a thousand will fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but no harm will come nigh thee because you have made the Lord your habitation. Praise God. There is a place of safety. There is a place where God's people will be kept during this time of great trouble. There is not a resurrection of the church before the time of great trouble. It is His church that He's going to send the rod of His strength out of, that He's going to reveal Himself through. Praise God. It says God will roar out of Zion. It is His church that Jesus is going to present Himself a glorious church to a lost and dying world and bring in the greatest harvest of souls during the greatest slaughter of human life that this world has ever seen. They coexist, they, they, they happen at the same time. 
We will be here for that time of great trouble. But Jesus said the coming of the Son of Man is going to be the same as in the days of Noah when they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage and knew not until the floods came and took them all away. He said it's going to be the same way. Jesus said it's going to come as a snare upon the whole world. Well, in the days of Noah, it says they knew not until the floods came. It took Noah 120 years to build the ark and it says he was a preacher of righteousness. He was warning the people, but they did not believe him. They did not believe that storm was coming. Jesus said it's going to be the same in this last generation. There's a storm coming like has never been. Jesus said since the beginning of creation, there has never been a time of trouble like this that's coming to this generation. There has never been a storm like this. You know, if the weatherman was predicting a hurricane, a Category 5 hurricane hitting Galveston and coming straight up 45, everybody would be buying the supplies at the stores. The shelves would be empty. Everybody would be preparing for that storm because they would believe the weatherman. Do you believe Jesus? Do you believe the Word of God? There's never been a time more urgent to draw nigh to God. Save yourself from this wicked and perverted generation that the wrath of God is coming upon. And Jesus said, all these things shall come upon this generation. That this generation will not pass away until all be fulfilled we're 54 years into it. And Jesus said, for the sake of the elect, it will be cut short. We don't know the day or the hour when He'll return, but we know where we are in history. We know where we are in His story. Be not deceived. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. Jesus came to save His people from their sin. The blood sanctifies and cleanses and makes holy. It always has and it always will when that truth is believed. Praise God. If being saved from your sin is what you want and what you need, you can have it today. But let no preacher, let no man tell you you're saved because you did this or this or this. Saved is when sin is gone and Christ dwells within. Praise God. God bless you.